Thanks for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Dave Chancellor and I'll be your host. Uh, so today we are going to be talking about the development of a measure of transportation security and how it can be used to better serve our communities. I am delighted to introduce our three presenters today. We are going to be hearing from Dr. Alex Goldworth, who is the Director of Family Economic Security Policy at the Washington Center for Economic, uh, Equitable Growth. Uh, Dr. Alexandra Murphy, who is an Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Michigan, and Aaron Steiner, who was most recently with the South Bend Commuters Trust in South Bend, Indiana. Uh, so thank Thanks to all of you for being here. I also want to thank the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services for their support of this webinar series. Uh, that said, any positions expressed in today's webinar aren't necessarily those of ASPE, the Institute for Research, or the Institute for Research on Poverty. Uh, and we have an hour today. In about the first half an hour here, uh, Alex Goldworth is going to give us an overview of why transportation matters and how uh, she and her team went about designing uh, the Transportation Security Index. Um, after that, we're going to hear from Alex Murphy and Aaron Steiner about how this index can be applied in policy settings and, and used by communities. Uh, then in the final 15 minutes or so, we are going to take your questions. So you'll see there's a Q&A box on the bottom of your screen, and you're welcome to type your questions in throughout the webinar, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can before our time's up. We also have the chat box open today, and you are welcome to uh, join in that way. Um, we always love to hear uh, where you're coming from, what organizations you're doing work with, and sort of your reactions to what you're hearing today. So please feel free to use that. And if it's helpful for you, uh, we have uh, closed captionings um, running today. So you can toggle those on and off at the bottom of your screen uh, in the closed caption button there. So um, with that, uh, I, I do want to let you know that we are um, sending out a recording uh, and a copy of the slides to all of you that registered. Uh, we'll send that out tomorrow. Uh, so you can look forward to that. Um, you can also, uh, if you want to just uh, subscribe on the IRP YouTube channel, uh, we always post those on there and uh, you'll get those notifications right away when we have them up. So so uh, with that, Alex Goldworth, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to invite you to share your slides right now, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, okay? Uh, thanks for that introduction, Dave. Yeah, I'm Alex Goldworth, um, and today I'm going to be presenting on joint uh, work with my colleague Alex Murphy, who's here as well presenting, uh, Karina McDonald Lopez and Jamie Griffin. Um, thanks so much to the Institute for Research on Poverty for having us, um, to my co-presenters, and to all of you who are tuning in. Um, today we're going to talk about how better measurement can improve transportation equity in underserved communities, and I'm going to start out by telling you about what transportation is security is. Um, great. Okay, so since we're here at the Institute for Research on Poverty, let's start by talking about the relationship between transportation and poverty. Um, so if you yourself have lived on a low income or even spent time in a low income community, what I'm going to tell you now might seem pretty obvious. To others, it might be a connection that you've yet to spend much time thinking about. But what this is, is it's a cycle where transportation insecurity and poverty are connected, right? So the first part of the cycle um, is that poverty makes it hard for people to access reliable transportation, right? So if you are lacking economic resources, then you um, might not have money for a car or for gas or for a bus fare to call a lift, right? You can't afford to purchase the transportation you need. At the same time, not having transportation makes it difficult to access destinations that combat poverty and address its symptoms, right? So if you can't afford transportation, it might be hard to get to work and earn a paycheck. It might be hard to get to education or job training to improve your skills, hard to get to social services um, to help with the, the poverty-related issues you're facing, or to doctor's offices to deal with the health problems that often come with being low income. You might not be able to get gro to grocery stores or other stores with prices of things that you need that you can actually afford, right? So this creates a cycle where you're having being not ha having a low income makes it hard to access transportation, having it hard to access transportation makes it hard to get the money and the services that you need. Okay, I think it's also really important to look at real people to think about how people think of transportation. And in the same way as we see lack of transportation as being connected to having a low income and difficulty getting by, people also recognize having transportation as a signifier of success. Um, so I want to take you to a conversation that I had when I was doing some research on job loss. So totally separate subject, but I'm interviewing someone who I'll call Ms. Henderson as a pseudonym, not her real name. Um, and I'm just trying to, you know, at the beginning of the interview, get a sense of who's in her family um, 
and kind of what her life is like. So I say to her, how old is your daughter now? And she responds, she's 20. So I'm like, okay, but what's your daughter up to these days? And Ms. Henderson gives an answer that I think is showing me that her daughter is doing well. She says to me, she's in college, she's working, she has her own transportation, she's doing good, no children, right? So here, Ms. Henderson is grouping having transportation with a bunch of other indicators that we normally think of as success, like college attendance, employment, um, delaying childbirth until you're ready, right? Um, so here, people are recognizing transportation as success. Yet, right, so despite these kind of clear languages, uh, both colloquially and uh, kind of um, intuitively, transportation is often missing from our analysis of poverty and inequality. So um, to kind of illustrate this, first I'm going to zoom in and talk to you about one specific measure of poverty and inequality, which is measures of material hardship. So some of you might be more familiar with the poverty line that uses income as a way to figure out if a person is um, kind of poor or not poor. But there's another suite of measures that I think is really awesome called measures of material hardship, where you directly ask people about whether or not the things they have, whether or not they have the things they need to get by. So did you run out of food before the end of the month? How, are you behind on rent? Have you been evicted? Um, can you pay for your utilities? Are you foregoing medical care? Do you have the durable goods you need like stove or refrigerator? And very conspicuously, transportation is omitted from these measures. Kind of zooming out to look at the bigger picture, very few studies of poverty examine transportation explicitly. Because transportation is so important, we see it kind of creeping into our, our work. Like, for example, if you're going to do an in-depth qualitative study of a low-income community, transportation is probably going to come up. And when we look, um, sometimes it's used as a control variable in the model, or when we're looking at other factors that are associated with being low income, like access to health care or work, um, we might look at transportation, but very rarely are we just looking at transportation in and of itself. So why are we doing this? Why, why aren't we studying transportation more when we're thinking about inequality in the United States? Well, first, you can't study what isn't defined. So here's a definition. Uh, my colleagues and I are defining transportation insecurity as a condition in which one is unable to regularly move from place to place in a safe or timely manner. Hope that one, you know, makes sense, feels good. That's what transportation insecurity is. But also, you can't study what you can't measure. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So in the course of today's presentation, I'm going to use some qualitative data to show how transportation insecurity is experienced. Then I'm going to show how this qualitative data informed the creation of a brand new measure, the Transportation Security Index. And then I'm going to put that measure to work using nationally representative data to show you what transportation insecurity looks like in the U.S. and the disparities and who experience it. And then finally, I'm going to turn it over to my co-author, Alex Murphy, and to Aaron Steiner to present some use cases for how the TSA can be deployed to advance transportation equity initiatives in the United States. That's the good part, right? Where we're learning how to actually make a difference with this information. All right, so let's dive right in. What does transportation insecurity look like and feel like to the people who are experiencing it? So to figure this out, we did qualitative um, research. So uh, we used 187 interviews that were conducted between 2009 and 2016 in a wide variety of places. So in Chicago, in the Pittsburgh suburb of Penn Hills, in Metro Detroit, um, including the city and the suburbs, and in rural Michigan. The people we talked to were diverse in terms of their age, their race, their ethnicity, and their socioeconomic status. We audio recorded these interviews, transcribed them, and coded them using a fancy software called Deduce. And then we also anonymized the interviews. So I'm going to be using pseudonyms throughout to protect people's privacy. Okay, so what did we find? We found that there are three clear manifestations of transportation insecurity, material, relational, and emotional. That might seem confusing. So let me start by just describing what each of them are. Okay, so the first manifestation is what we call material. These are the kinds of manifestations of transportation insecurity that can be physically observed, and they indicate whether people can get around safely and in a timely manner. So let's talk about uh, one respondent, Daria. Daria is a low-income Black woman living in Detroit. She doesn't have a license, she doesn't have a car, and instead she gets around by riding the city bus. She was attending a class once a week, but, well, she was relying on the bus and it would either not arrive or arrive late and so she'd miss her class. So when she was missing so many classes, she quit going altogether. 
The bus is so unreliable that Daria is often left waiting a long time at the bus stop, which causes her to feel unsafe, especially at night. She used to go to synagogue at night, but because there were no lights at the bus stop and she felt so unsafe waiting, she stopped going to the Friday night service, right? So here we can see some very tangible ways that we can observe transportation insecurity, right? Daria is late. She is missing her class. She is not taking transportation at all. She is unsafe when she is in transit. So to zoom out, to look across the whole sample, we found, found several examples of material manifestation. So one is time consuming travel and trip planning, both taking a long time to do your commute and also taking a long time to either like figure out how you're gonna get there. Maybe you're checking out the bus timetable. Maybe you're calling a bunch of people to see who can give you a ride. Unsafe travel, whether that's the lack of lights at the bus stop, um, uh, having you know a train line where violent incidents are occurring, or even just using a car that's not very safe to ride in. Having long wait times, either waiting for transit to come and pick you up or taking some kind of transit, um, a bus or maybe a ride from someone that gets you to your destination, maybe like an hour before you need to be there and you're just waiting for that hour. Having complicated commutes or being unable to travel at all. Okay, so that was material manifestations. Let's talk about these relational manifestations. These pertain to social strains that either come from using your social networks to get around or from the inability to see other people because of transportation problems. We can talk about Cynthia as an example. She's a poor black woman living in Chicago. She doesn't have a car and she relies on a combination of public transit and rides from others to get around. However, there was recently a violent incident on the transit line by her house, so she has stopped using public transit. Now, if she needs or wants to go anywhere, she will try to get a ride from a friend or family member, which has been a frustrating experience for her. She dislikes asking for rides because she feels like a burden. And when she does ask for rides, the rides are only reliable about half the time. Half of the other half of the time, the, the person giving her a ride forgets and doesn't show up or they're late. As a result, Cynthia spends a lot of time sitting and waiting on transportation or simply stuck at home. So in her story, you can see these material manifestations, sitting and waiting, being stuck at home, but also this real social dynamic where she is uncomfortable asking for rides, feeling like a burden, and then disappointed in her, in her friends or whoever else is trying, is kind of falling through on giving her the rides. All right, so again, let's zoom out to look at these social manifestations, these relational manifestations of transportation insecurity. Um, transportation insecurity strains relationships, and there's three big ways that we see this happening. So one is unbalanced power dynamics and ride seeking, right? So if my cousin or my neighbor or my friend has a car and I need to ask them a lot if they will give me a ride or let me borrow the car, then I am kind of asking a lot of favors and maybe owing them a lot that I'm not providing, creating an, un, like an imbalance in a relationship that might otherwise be more equal. There's also very real social isolation if you're stuck at home and can't see other people. And there's difficulty forming new relationships. So if you can't get out to the bar or to church or the playground, how are you gonna meet new people to know? Um, maybe you're able to use a dating app and go on a first date and there's a little spark, but if you can't get to places to meet up with this new person, you might not be able to pursue that romantic relationship. Okay, so those are the social manifestations. Um, and this ties into this third emotional manifestation of transportation insecurity, being stuck at home, managing strained relationships, social isolation, just, you know, all of these issues with transportation take a real emotional and psychological toll. So let's look at the case of Tyra. Tyra is a low income woman living in Penn Hills, which is a suburb of Pittsburgh. Her transportation insecurity has severely affected her ability to get around and has, as such has caused her great emotional turmoil. Because she doesn't have a car and there's no bus service in her neighborhood, she's almost entirely dependent on other people for rides, which makes it difficult for her to get to where she needs to go. But it hasn't always been this way. Before she moved to Penn Hills, she lived in an urban area, but she moved because there was a lot of fighting, a lot of aggravated ass assault. Um, now in Penn Hills, though, she feels trapped in her house because she doesn't know anyone who lives around her, and so she often feels depressed and isolated. She didn't feel this way before she moved, or even when she first moved to Penn Hills because the bus services were running 
really well. But there was a change kind of in, in policy and the, the buses were cut off in her neighborhood. And she tells us if it weren't for her mother visiting her once a month, she would lose her mind out there. So here you're seeing um, kind of the, the material manifestation of being stuck at home and some of the uh, relational manifestations of being dependent on rides, but also these very real emotional issues, being depressed, being isolated, feeling that she, like she's going to lose her mind. Looking across the broad sample, we see lots of examples of emotional manifestation. We feel, we see stress and strain. We see embarrassment, right? Like there's this idea that if you have transportation, you've achieved success. And so if you don't have transportation, you might feel like you've failed and feel embarrassed by that. You might feel trapped or lonely or depressed. You might feel powerless, right? Transportation is how we get out there in the world and do the things that we want to do. And so without transportation, we can feel incapacitated and powerless. Powerless. Okay, so this is what transportation insecurity looks like. How are we going to measure um, kind of like in a broader sense rather than these in-depth qualitative uh, kind of in methods? How are we going to figure out who is transportation insecure? So right, we're at the Institute for Research on Poverty. What do poverty researchers do? Um, most often they use car ownership as a proxy for transportation security. So for example, one of our very best, most amazing longitudinal studies, the, uh, the surveys, the panel study of income dynamics uses this question. Do you or anyone else in your family living there own or lease a car or other vehicle for personal use? But we know from our qualitative data that while owning a car is associated with transportation insecurity, it's not the whole picture. So you can have a car that won't run because it needs repairs you can't afford. Or maybe you can't afford to fill up the tank with gas or to buy insurance. Or maybe you have a car in your house, but there are so many other people in your household who are trying to use it, it's really hard to get access to it when you need it. On the flip side, Maybe you live without a car, but you have no transportation issues because you can walk to everything you need. Or maybe you can take public transit, or maybe you have a ton of really nice friends who will give you a ride no problem. Maybe you can afford taxi fare or a ride share, or maybe you can bike and get to every place you need to go. So lacking a car doesn't mean that you lack access to adequate transportation. So car ownership is the most frequently used measure of access to adequate transportation in the poverty literature, but there are other disciplines and areas of study that use their own tools. So some frequent measures include mode of transit, right? Like, are you taking the subway? Are you taking the bus? Are you walking? Are you taking the car? But like we've discussed, just knowing the mode doesn't know how well you're meeting your transportation needs. There's also a really awesome suite of measures called neighborhood accessibility that look at where you live and your proximity to transit, your access to destinations, um, the walkability of your area. But the problem with this is neighborhood level measures assign the same scores to a transportation secure person and their insecure neighbor. So for example, I could be a super healthy, fit, ready to go, go, go person with a car available to me and a bus stop nearby that I can just hop on and take the bus. My neighbor might have a disability that prevents them from moving as easily. So maybe they use a wheelchair and maybe that bus stop, maybe they don't have a car and maybe that bus stop that is so close and accessible for me doesn't have a sidewalk. So in the winter when it snows, there's no way for them to get to the bus stop safely. They might be stuck at home, very transportation insecure while I'm moving about very freely, yet we would both have the same score of neighborhood accessibility. There's measures of trans travel behavior, your commute time and these activity-based models. Can you get, how do you get to the places where you're going? But these can't capture unmet demand or, you know, basically like if you don't have transportation and are stuck at home and not moving, there's gonna be no commute for you to be, to be observed, right? And then there's the housing and transportation affordability index, which is really neat, but affordability is a bit of a different question about whether you have access to the transportation you need. Okay, so I hope I've made the case to you. A new measure is needed. We need to measure transportation insecurity at the individual level to determine its effects on well being and also people's ability to access programs. And our existing measures are just not cutting it. Um, but let's not be too critical, right? Like, 
it is very hard of these existing measures. They are great measures and it is very hard to measure transportation um, insecurity precisely at the individual level. So think of all the variables we've discussed that affect your ability to get to the places you need to go. Do you have a car? Does it run? Is your license suspended? How's the bus service? Does it run frequently at the time when you need to get places? Is it on time? How's your physical health? Can you ride a bike? What about your family? Will they give you a ride without making you feel bad? There are so many variables affecting your ability to get to the places you need to go, making it really hard to measure access to adequate transportation. But it's important to measure it. So what did we do? Um, we looked to the food insecurity, the food security index for inspiration. So similar to transportation, there are many variables that affect food security. So your ability to prepare food, the cost of food, the quality of food, the amount of food, the number of people in your household consuming the food. Using questions like the ones on the screen, the food security index measures symptoms of food insecurity as people experience them rather than the inputs that affect it, like calories consumed, right? So we ask, in the last 12 months, did you ever eat less than you felt you should? Because there just wasn't enough money for food, right? These are measures. These questions are measuring the symptoms of food insecurity. Okay, so now that we're inspired, what did we do? We sat down and we did some brainstorming. We came up with survey items based on our qualitative data, capturing all three kinds of manifestations of transportation insecurity. We were really careful in crafting these questions not to use dependent variables that would interest other researchers. So what does that mean? That means people are probably really interested in whether transportation insecurity affects your employment. So we're not going to ask a question that says, did you have problems getting to work because of transportation? Because then it's going to be really hard to use that question to measure whether or not you get to work. It's like a circular logic. So very careful to really just look at the three manifestations as we saw them without getting into these outcome variables. Okay, so we brainstormed all these questions and then we wanted to test them out. A cognitive interview is an interview where you give someone a survey and then you walk through with them how they were thinking when they were answering that surveys. We did 52 of these cognitive interviews in Chicago and urban, suburban, and rural Michigan. We identified our respondents through, through nonprofit organizations, door knocking, and snowball sampling. And we coded the responses for question comprehension, recall, and judgment. So burdens and items items, ones that were really hard to like figure out, were refined. The items that generated false positives, like items that people who are super transportation secure would say yes, yes, yes to, we dropped those and we developed new items. And in the end, we had a set of 23 potential TSI items. Then we moved on to bigger, bolder things, to fielding surveys. Um, we fielded two surveys using um, this organization called GSK's nationally representative web-based online panel, the Knowledge Panel. First, we surveyed 500 people. And then in May of 2018, we did about 2,000 respondents um, with a nationally representative sample. We asked them the TSI questions and then a whole bunch of other questions to understand who these people were and what their experiences were like. We then examined the data using descriptive statistics and we conducted exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis. And then we arrived at the final TSI, which is a validated individual level measure um, that directly captures the experience of transportation insecurity, regardless of geography or mode of transit. Very exciting. Okay. So what does this look like, right? We have 16 items, each of which measure a unique symptom of transportation insecurity across all three manifestations. So taking a long time getting places, skipping trips, worrying, feeling left out, feeling bad, feeling embarrassed, right? These are some of the questions to really drill deeper into what they look like. So all of the questions begin with a 30 day reference period, right? So in this example, we say in the past 30 days, how often did you feel stuck at home because of a problem with transportation? And then all of the questions allow you to select often, sometimes, or never. When you're trying to score and figure out how transportation insecure a person is, um, items that where someone says oh, never get a score of zero. If they say sometimes, there's a score of one. And if they say often, there's a score of two. Then you add up all the scores and you get a possible cumulative score that ranges from zero to 32. So what does this look like? If you look at the graph on the right, which are the sum scores across our whole nationally representative sample, you'll see the distribution of those TSI scores, those transportation security index scores. So most people, that big top left bar, um, describe experiencing no symptoms at all, 
and then smaller numbers experience each of the scores up to 32. To meaningfully break up these scores into interpretable categories, we group the respondents in the following way. So if you get a score from zero to two, um, at the top end of that at two, you could say sometimes to two items or often to one item. Given that there are 16 items, we think that if you're endorsing these, these small number of items to get to a score of two, you're probably not transportation insecure. Then if we go to the next category, marginal insecurity, at the bottom end of that category is a score of three, which would mean that you've said sometimes to three items, or you've said often to one item and sometimes to another. Um, we think that's probably a marginal case of transportation insecurity. Low insecurity um, is a score of six to 10, moderate it's 11 to 16, and then if you have a score of 17 or higher, it means at the lower end at 17 that you have said sometimes to every single category and often to one, or you've said often to a whole bunch of categories, which means you probably have a very high level of transportation insecurity. So there it is. That is the transportation security index and how we measure transportation insecurity. Um, maybe that was a little boring. Let's get like into the weeds of it and see what transportation insecurity actually looks like in this country. So when we're looking at data from 2018, we're finding that about three quarters of the United States population, that big dark green slice, um, are not transportation insecure. We have 13% of people that next um, darkest bar um, that have low insecurity, then 8% have moderate insecurity, and then this very um, small slice have high insecurity of the light green bar. Um, then if we're looking at prevalence of transportation insecurity by poverty level, right, that is um, the thing that, you know, maybe this group is most interested in. Um, I'm going to walk you through the chart. So the gray bar at the bottom is people with no insecurity present. Then the golden bar is marginal insecurity. The brown bar is low. The green is moderate. And that blue bar is the highest level of insecurity. So at or below the poverty line, 100% of the poverty threshold is the lowest income people in our sample. And you'll see that um, more than half of them have some level of transportation insecurity. If we go about next to people who are at 100 to 200% of the poverty line, so these are people that are not technically classified as poor, but probably have some trouble making ends meet. Um, we're seeing that there's more people about seven in 10 who aren't experiencing insecurity, but three in 10 are. And then the highest income group has the lowest level of transportation insecurity. It's pretty much what you'd expect. All right, so then let's talk, turn to rates of transportation insecurity by race or ethnicity. Here we've collapsed the categories to be three. So gray is the secure again, and then we've collapsed marginal and low to the golden bars, moderate and severe to the um, brown bars. Um, so looking at it, you'll see that the most demographically advantaged racial category in the United States, uh, white people are having the highest levels of transportation security and the lowest levels of insecurity. If we look at more disadvantaged racial groups, um, African American and Latino respondents, we're going to see that the level of security is lower and the level of insecurity is higher. And then finally, if we look at this other category, that's where we're seeing the highest levels of transportation insecurity, um, which is an interesting puzzle to dive into. Um, in, in analyses that aren't shown here, we're further finding that there's similar disproportional rates within typically vulnerable demographic groups. So um, those people with a high school education or less are more likely to be transportation insecure um, as are people with children. Okay. So we spent so much time talking about car ownership. So let's kind of dive in and take a look at this one. To, to read this chart, um, the gray bars are folks that are not car owners and the golden bars on top are people that do own cars. Um, and then we've grouped each category of transportation insecurity. So the left bar is people who are not insecure and the right bar is people with the highest level of insecurity. So you can see here pretty clearly that car ownership is not the same as transportation insecurity. In the leftmost bar, you can see that more than four in 10 people who are not experiencing any transportation insecurity at all um, 
do not own a car, right? So maybe they're your bikers and your walkers. Um, looking at the furthest right bar, you can see that more than one in 10 people with the highest level of transportation insecurity indeed do have a car. Okay, so it's not the same, but as you might guess, we can also see a clear relationship between car ownership and transportation insecurity um, with people with more people who are more secure owning cars. So we see this beautiful gradient. If you look at those yellow bars, um, the more secure you are, the more likely you're gonna be to own a car, right? Okay, so that kind of all checks out. But our measure does produce some counterintuitive findings. So again, to read this chart, the gray bars are where no insecurity is present and the colored bars are various levels of transportation insecurity. And here we've grouped our sample into urban, suburban, and rural people. Here, it appears that people in rural areas are less likely to experience transportation insecurity, despite the fact that existing literature and qualitative evidence and just common sense suggests that they would be more likely to experience insecurity. And we have a similar finding with age where older adults are more likely to be transportation secure. So what is going on here? Why might this be the case? So um, first, our findings could be surprising, but accurate. So maybe people who are in life stages or geographic locations where transportation is harder to access work really hard to arrange good transportation and then they've got it solid. Or maybe people selected into rural living only when they can access transportation that meets their needs. Or maybe there's a problem with our sample. Maybe a web-based sample that relies on internet access selects older adults and people living in rural communities that are disproportionately likely to be transportation secure. Or maybe people who have a very hard, okay, this is actually, pay attention to this one. I think it's the more interest, most interesting one. Um, maybe people who have a really hard time accessing transportation in rural areas or because of their age restrict their travel so much that they don't even see the ways that their transportation is limited. Maybe they're never skipping a trip because they've stopped planning trips in the first place. If this third explanation is the case, then our prevalence estimates are actually under reports of how often transportation insecurity exists. So that first pie chart that I showed you, where it's three quarters of folks were secure, um, it, it would actually be a much lower number that are secure in the United States. All right, so this is what we've found out so far. What are we doing next? So the first step is to better understand and address the systematic underreporting that I was just describing. And then we need to create a shorter measure, right? 16 questions is a lot. Um, lucky for you, we are already in the process of developing this short form. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get it down to three very easy questions that are almost as predictive as these 16 items that you can just drop onto whatever survey um, is interesting to you. And then most importantly, we need to apply it to the real world. And I'm gonna turn it over to my um, co-author, Alex Murphy, to talk about that. Thanks, Alex, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, so one of the things that we're really excited about the Transportation Security Index is all the possible use cases for it. And we think that that many different kinds of people can use it, that governments at all levels, uh, federal government, states, cities, local municipalities can use it. We think that it can be useful for planners, for researchers, for service providers, for transit agencies, for communities themselves. And I'm just, there's, there's a lot of, uh, possible use cases, and we can talk about them more in the Q&A, but I'm going to highlight three in particular. Um, so one is that if the Transportation Security Index were put on a reoccurring nationally representative survey, something like the Pulse Survey, the American Community Survey, the Census, one thing that we could do as, uh, is document the prevalence of transportation insecurity like we did today, but also track it over time. And one thing that would allow us to do is see whether and how uh, disparities are widening or closing across time. It would allow us to see whether shifts in the, the geography of poverty, like the suburbanization of poverty, uh, how that's shaping the prevalence of transportation insecurity. It would also uh, allow us to look at how new transportation technologies, so things like autonomous vehicles, are impacting rates of transportation insecurity over time. Um, another possible use case is that, you know, that the, the, the measure could be used to identify geographic hotspots of transportation insecurity um, to decide when and how and where to allocate resources. So we think about resources like mobility interventions, like 
new transit routes or stops. You could identify geographic hotspots and think about, you know, where do we want to put, if we have transit vouchers that we could use, where should we direct those resources? Um, social service agencies who are interested in understanding where people who might need their services but may not be able to get to them um, could think about, you know, where there are hotspots of insecurity that they could use more mobile services with. And in fact, um, this use case is something that the city of Detroit has uh, really been interested in. They've been using um, the Transportation Security Index and partnered with uh, uh, local researchers at the University of Michigan. And they fielded an original survey and they've been very interested in looking at both the prevalence and disparities of transportation and security in the city of Detroit, but also looking at where there are hotspots and thinking about how they can allocate resources uh, to those hotspots in really targeted ways. Um, another way that we can use the Transportation Security Index is to evaluate interventions that we uh, are putting in the field that are trying to alleviate transportation insecurity and try to make people more mobile. And we can use these to evaluate whether our interventions are moving people from transportation insecurity to transportation security, or conversely, we can look at whether our interventions are exacerbating existing disparities. Conversely, we can use the measure to also look at whether things like cutting bus, bus transit stops um, are exacerbating existing disparities and, and how they may be doing so. And in, in this use case, evaluating transportation interventions is uh, something that people um, in South Bend, Indiana, Commuters Trust have been doing. And so I'm really excited to welcome Aaron Steiner, who was formerly with Commuters Trust uh, of South Bend, Indiana, to this conversation to talk a little bit about their intervention and how the Transportation Security Index was useful in evaluating it. So I want to just kick it off, Aaron, and ask you very briefly if you could give us a sense of what Commuters Trust is, you know, what, what are what were its origins, how did it come to be, and how does it how does it work? Sure, Alex, and great to be on, and it's great to hear sort of the whole story of how you've come so far with the TSI and how and we can kind of share a little bit of how we put it to use in South Bend. You did mention, I just want to say too, that I'm formerly a Commuters Trust and of the city of South Bend, but I departed that role as program director just about um, two months or so ago, and it's still up and running, and I will give a shout out to the team. I think some of them are probably listening in today who are making the program happen, but what is the program? Um, Commuters Trust is a program that's sponsored by the city of South Bend, and the whole goal and the impetus was um, the city and the innovation team at the city back in 2018 thinking about how could we, how might we help residents who have barriers and obstacles with transportation, specifically access work and access employment more easily. Um, and back in 2018, when this idea came around, um, that was back under our former mayor, Mayor Pete, um, and the innovation team applied to a grant through the Bloomberg Philanthropies Mayor's Challenge and was one of the cities to win the three-year grant to pilot ideas. Um, and our, our specific idea was around transportation challenges and barriers. Um, and the idea was, you know, we know that it's a problem for residents getting to and from work, um, especially um, lower income hourly wage workers who may work non-standard schedules, work overnights, that type of thing. Um, but we also know that it's been a, a, an ongoing challenge for employers in the region to attract and retain and recruit talent. So we we're trying to solve for both of those. And the idea, the concept is transportation as a benefit. So how can we package different transportation benefits and options um, and then, you know, provide that to um, the workforce via their employer, right? So as an employer-sponsored benefit. So the program sort of in its current form launched in um, late 2019, and it's been running, running continuously since then. Um, we've been piloting a number of different transportation benefits. So we've worked consistently with our local bus system, local transit agency, Transpo, which serves South Bend and our neighboring city, Mishawaka, as well as Uber and Lyft, been working with both of them. Um, and we did pilot at the height of the pandemic, which was not, you know, great timing in our part, a carpool benefit. Um, and that was sort of an interesting experience to try to navigate then. Um, but um, throughout the program, you know, we've done as of um, a couple months ago, just over 10,000 free or discounted rides for over 500 participants, all with the goal of how can we help mitigate transportation barriers, primarily having to do with getting to and from work. So Erin, um, I mean, uh, one question I have for you is how did you hear about the Transportation Security Index and what why what was appealing about it to you? What why did you think that you had to use it in this program? Yeah, well, I, I don't remember exactly who made the connection to you and your team, but I know that we were in conversation with some other um, researchers at the University of Michigan about our program. And sort of we made the connection around a time when we had been doing program evaluation for about a year and a half and had been really focused on 
trying to measure attendance impact. So by providing transportation benefits, can we improve attendance and thereby retention for employees? And just we were running into a lot of obstacles. You know, there's many other factors that go into someone's attendance at work besides transportation. And so we weren't really seeing the needle move. But we knew that from sort of anecdotal and from interviews, right, that we were having a really significant impact on folks' ability to just get around and not just getting to and from work, but right, getting to childcare to drop their kids off or pick them up, right, getting to the grocery store through the program that we had put together. But we weren't really capturing that in the measures that, you know, we were looking at. So we were looking at a way to more quantifiably measure the impact of the program on someone's overall transportation situation. Um, so the timing was good in that regard that, you know, we all kind of connected and we were still at that point sort of, you know, rounding out, I think, some of the long, long form um, TSI survey sort of research and getting that sort of um, all of them put together. So we actually then implemented um, that, that long form question there um, in some of our surveys and that type of thing. Um, so that's, I think, kind of how we all got connected anyway. And did you find it useful for your purposes? And how, how what, what did it reveal anything that you that helped you think about the program, helped you um, retool it in different ways? And I'm mm -hmm. also curious, you know, one of the funders always want to see results. And, and was it useful for you in that regard as well? Mm -hmm. Well, it is a new measure. So we've had to sort of explain both to our funders and then also some of our local community partners who are invested in the program, what the measure is sort of capturing and how we're using it. Um, so we've had to do some work on that end. But I would say, you know, in terms of kind of us even understanding the efficacy and sort of the impact of the program for ourselves, you know, one thing I would say is that, um, you know, I think that we always knew that our program, you know, might be underserving folks um, who have maybe the most insecurity um, and who face the most barriers and are likely to be the folks in the greatest degree of poverty. Um, part of that is, you know, we rely on Uber, Lyft, and some other tech-enabled solutions. If you don't have a smartphone, you might have limited access. But also, as we're kind of, you know, hearing from other Alex earlier, right, um, it's likely that high degree of high degrees of transportation insecurity correlate with higher degrees of poverty. Mm -hmm. And there are so many other obstacles, right, that might prevent someone um, not just it being transportation from accessing opportunity. And I think zooming out and sort of looking at the picture of someone's transportation security more broadly helped us to draw helped us to draw some of those connections. Um, and one of the things that the team um, has been doing since I departed is expanding to not just be focused on employed residents and workers at some of our employer partners, but we're especially expanding to about a dozen um, local nonprofit social service providers. So a homelessness agency, workforce development, job training, a couple of other um, similar organizations. And part of the theory around that or the hypothesis is we know that those organizations are providing some of the other wraparound supports, right? Whether it's education, training, food access, et cetera, we can come, you know, join forces basically with them with a transportation solution. And will we then for that most transportation insecure population be able to actually move the needle and help them, you know, make more progress on the road to opportunity. So what you're saying, just to, to reiterate, I think what you're saying, and please let me know if I'm getting this wrong, is that the index allowed you to really identify different groups of people. You know, Alex was talking previously about people who had low, moderate, high, and that what you were seeing once you were able to identify those groups is that that your intervention was working differently, that there was some group, especially the high, that it wasn't actually people weren't taking up the vouchers and it wasn't getting people to work in the way that you had envisioned differently than people who had a little less insecurity. And so Exactly. That allowed you to rethink about and reimagine, like, what is this group need that we, you know, how do we re envision the program so we can target that group specifically and uh, make adjustments? Is that? Yeah, exactly. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I don't know that, you know, we would have, I think that we had that hypothesis, but, you know, being able to look at, you know, the picture of transportation insecurity and then sort of segment the population that we are trying to serve and work with helped us, I think, see the possibilities of where we could take the program more clearly. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, thank you, Erin. Um, I'm gonna kick it over now to Dave um, to open up for questions, but I really appreciate that. And it's been really, for us, it's been really fun to work with community partners like yourself and see how it's working and um, see it on the ground, making differences in people's lives. So thank you.
Okay. Um, well, Alex, Alex and Aaron, thank you all so much for taking the time to do those presentations and to kind of go through some of the work that you've been doing there. Um, and I just want to remind folks uh, to type in your questions. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left and we'd love to get to some of those. So, uh, but to start us off, I want to kind of key back to something that Aaron was saying. You know, you were talking about sort of forming partnerships with other agencies and other sort of organizations uh, that you've been working with. And it seems like that's possibly uh, an important theme as we think about transportation. And, and I'm, uh, uh, you know, just I, one from like a research perspective, you know, this seems like it's a very interdisciplinary thing, right? Um, and and I'm hoping uh, Alex and Alex, you can help us think about that. And then Aaron, I want to kind of turn to you and and have you maybe talk about how uh, some of those partnerships have gone. So Alex Goldworth, would you start us off on that? I actually turn that over to Alex Murphy. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so the question is the interdisciplinary nature. Of, of transportation and also how we partner with communities. Uh, uh, transportation touches on everything and it is very interdisciplinary. I mean, so from a scholarly perspective, I think you see, you know, for Alex and I, one of the interests that we had in transportation was we were both in the field doing interviews and ethnographic work with low-income populations and seeing transportation matter in all kinds of ways, the ways we described and coming out and saying, why were we so surprised by how profound transportation was in the lives of low-income people that we were studying? Why, why weren't we prepared to really understand this? Um, and so for us, we turned to the literature and we saw, um, you know, we saw that urban planners have large, transportation has largely been in the domain of urban planners. Um, and, and, you know, to the extent that social scientists have been studying it, people, economists study it through the lens of spatial mismatch. Um, but, and that it's usually, it's very sort of auxiliary in the way that people have looked at it. Like everyone knows that transportation matters and they use it as a control variable to see like if we control for transportation, um, you know, does that wash away some effects? But we, we, you know, we thought that there was, our thinking on this has been very interdisciplinary and trying to think through, we've worked with urban planners and health professionals and, and, you know, tried to, to think about all the ways that sociology, especially, um, you know, we're both sociologists. So. We think sociology has a lot to offer, especially along the relational dimensions. You know, I mean, if you look at a lot of qualitative work, it talks about how people use their social networks to get around. And this is something that uh, we know, but hasn't been captured, but it's very, very important to the lived experience of people. And so we, you know, we thought that I think as much as transportation is interdisciplinary, you know, it's not just about the infrastructure, the roads and the bridges. It's about the people, the people who get you there, the people you want to get to. Um, and so, uh, you know, thinking about it interdisciplinarily has always been at the center. And um, so too has been thinking about working with many different kinds of partners from government agencies like the city of Detroit. We've had a lot of work with to uh, community partners like Aaron. And so I'll kick it off to you, Aaron, to answer the rest of the question. Yeah, and I would just say, David, we're just kind of put a further detail on how we're partnering with some of our local agencies and partners. For example, one of the nonprofit partners is a women's shelter, right? That provides a suite of sort of support services um, including temporary housing and the benefits that we're offering, right? It's either a free, um, well, a combination of a free bus pass, either a digital one or a physical one, and then um, a set of up to 10 free Uber or Lyft rides per month. And we're doing that on a monthly recurring basis and trying to then measure, you know, what are some of the possible impacts um, overall the TSI and then sort of more broadly access to opportunity. Um, so that's kind of, we're sort of doing that with 12 different organizations um, in the community for the next year. Um, and I think we'll learn a lot about how in practice, right, we're taking sort of sort of a, um, you know, trying to find the population that we're, you know, feel is most in need and underserved and reach them through these partners. And, you know, what's the level of impact that we can have on some of their access to opportunity. I'll just say briefly, too, that um, our community is also on the cusp of some transit redesign and planning. Um, and so the city, I think, we are sort of approaching our role in that even a little differently from this experience, right? Having a better understanding of both the TSI um, and frankly, even just this way of um, looking at the problem. Um, and I'm hopeful that that informs, you know, the over the next months and years, our redesign work um, as well. 
Um, you know, we, I've, I've seen a few things come up in the chat. And we also had some earlier questions. Um, looking at sort of, you know, one of the questions was just about diversity uh, within the sample, within the qualitative sample, uh, folks that you were talking to. And, um, and you know, Alex Goldworth, if you'd be willing to, I know we answered, some folks have kind of responded to this uh, within the chat, but also just kind of um, reemphasize where you were talking to people from. Tell us about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think the first thing is to note that I did a little bit of sloppy work when I was pulling together the three case studies. Um, so someone mentioned, right, it looks like that you're talking all about low income women, predominantly black women. And those are the three examples that I pulled um, as I was pulling together the presentation, but they're not representative of the experiences of transportation insecurity. So we talked to people um, who were rich and who were poor and who were from every demographic group. And we saw plenty of experiences of transportation insecurity among white people, among Latino people, among African-American people, of people um, who are male and who are female. Um, but I think it was pretty clear that transportation insecurity was happening more among people who are low income. And we also saw more transportation insecurity in our qualitative work among people with disabilities. So really important um, and apologize for the sloppy work uh, on those three examples. Um, and then I think kind of pulling back to talk more about, you know, where geographically the qualitative data came from. So we were really careful on the demographic characteristics to get people across a wide range of categories. So it was important that we also, you know, look at in information from people who are high income to make sure that we could really contrast the experiences. Um, and in the same way, we wanted to look at all different types of geographic areas. So we looked at suburbs, uh, wealthy suburbs in Metro Detroit, um, Penn Hills, a Pittsburgh suburb that Alex can tell you a lot more, urban areas inside of Detroit that has really poor transportation in infrastructure in Chicago where trans transportation infrastructure is better and also rural areas. Um, so then, um, and I'm, I'm seeing a note that it would be good to use African-American instead of poor black or low income blacks. And I can totally do that. I wanna be conscious of, you know, some people who don't identify as being African-American because they're recent immigrants or things like that. But I think you're right. We're mostly talking about African-American people. And we interviewed African-American people who were high in income and also low income. Um, okay, so everybody across these geographic areas and these demographic groups um, are experiencing transportation uh, insecurity. And then we moved to this survey where we had almost 2000 people that we were looking at of, in every corner of the world, or not world, country. Um, of all demographic groups, they it mirrored the demographic composition of our country um, and also the geographic spread of people in our country. And I don't know if Alex, you want to give a little more context on what Penn Hills is. Sure. Penn Hills um, is a, a very classic post-war bedroom suburb outside of um, the city of Pittsburgh. It's about 19 square miles. It's, uh, if you look it up on Google Maps, the built environment um, is, it looks nothing like the city. It's got winding, twisting roads, cul-de-sacs. Um, it once, during the, during the study time period, uh, public transportation there was relatively adequate. And while I was there, I spent three and a half years there living there. Um, and uh, in, in the middle of field work, the public transit system was cut in half. And so people, uh, lo low-income people had moved to the suburbs seeking opportunity um, and had, hadn't anticipated that, you know, they thought that they, many people moved to places that were on bus lines, thought that this would be a place that they could get access to better schools, better neighborhoods for their children. And, um, you know, in, in a matter of a very short time, without transportation, they found themselves stuck and trying to figure out whether it was worth staying. Um, a lot of people talked about whether, you know, they were thinking about trade-offs between living in the city and living in the suburbs and feeling like there was a trade-off between uh, neighborhoods that they felt like were unsafe in the city and feeling like they were trapped and isolated in a suburb without transportation. Um, so Penn Hills, it's a very, I mean, it's just imagine classic post-war suburb, almost no sidewalks, no public transit. You, it, uh, you really need to have a car to get anywhere in that place. I want to dwell a little bit, uh, you know, um, Alex Goldworth, uh, later in your slides, you had, uh, you know, a, a few things talking about some of the differences you saw between um, urban, suburban, and rural. Um, and Alex Murphy, I know you've done quite a bit of work, uh, especially in suburban areas, as you just kind of talked about there, but um, help us to think a little bit more about that, you know, sort of, you know, the way that public transit fits into this picture and, you know, sort of differences, maybe car ownership that we're going to see. And what are some of the things that you're paying attention to, especially as you're thinking about this, this measure, thinking about sort of the different places that people are in? Um, Alex Murphy, do you want to start us off there? 
Sure. Thanks, Dave. Um, you know, I think for us, almost every question you can ask is sort of an empirical question that we haven't, no one's really looked at transportation in this way. I mean, we've looked at transportation by looking at modes of transit. Um, but for us, this is a big research question is what is, how is transportation and security shaped by car ownership, uh, by public transit access, by having access to sidewalks, by, you know, the built environment, things like having lights that make you feel safe walking and um, as part of our data set, we have um, one of the reasons that we used GFK to gather data was we were able to purchase GIS location data and pull um, uh, data on where people are living and sort of factor that in. So one of the, in the we, we have a whole range of questions we're really interested in. And one is, what is it about place that really matters, right? So you can see there's disparities across urban, rural, suburban areas, but how does car ownership perhaps matter differently in urban, rural, suburban areas? How does, you know, public transit matter differently? Um, I think these are all open questions that we we hope to answer in the future. And um, uh, so that may be an unsatisfying answer, but you know, I think we're ex excited to explore that. Okay. Alex Goldorf, did you have more you wanted to add there? That's good. No, okay. Uh, you know, so I, I think I, I, I wanna move to talking about funding a little bit here because we have sort of two distinct pictures, uh, questions about uh, funding pictures here. And I, I wanna go to Aaron Steiner first um, because, you know, uh, the South Bend Commuters Trust, you know, you won um, a grant from the Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge uh, initiative there. And, you know, so, but how do some of these, you know, how do you see some of these lo longer term, you know, some of these initiatives to help people get to where they need to go? Uh, uh, you know, is is there is there a funding picture there? You know, what do we see going forward, and, and what did you kind of encounter in what in the work that you were doing there? Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a lot of interest, not just you know the initial funding from Bloomberg, but ongoing interest that if we're really able to solve some of the issues that we set out for, right, um, set out to solve, that there is either you know public dollars or other private philanthropic and grant dollars that might be available. Um, but frankly, it comes down to showing the impact and measuring the impact, which is what we're all sort of talking about, or at least for our purposes, how we're trying to deploy and use the transportation security index. Um, so the more that that index you know, becomes, and this measure becomes validated and becomes known, I think the more useful it is to folks like us who are trying to stand up new programs, right, um, that are having an impact in this way. Um, I would say for us specifically in South Bend, you know, we've had interest certainly from our employer partners and they have been contributing along the way. So this is an employer sponsored benefit. We do charge a copay, if you will, to some of our employee participants. So we've been a kind of experimenting with the long run funding opportunities, but I would say big picture, you know, the more that we're able to tell the story and show quantifiably the impact using a metric like the TSI, the, you know, better the case for funding will be down the road. Okay. And the part two of that question, Alex and Alex, is, you know, how do we, uh, you know, get funding for these kinds of measures? How do we incorporate them uh, into, into broader uh, measures that are being used? And, um, and so what, uh, what are the two of you thinking about moving forward uh, with that? Do you want me to go, Alex? Uh, you know, Developing the Food Insecurity Index took uh, the, really the backing of the USDA. It started with researchers at Cornell University who are doing qualitative work and developing an original measure. And um, at some point in the 1990s, the USDA, the, you know, the United States Department of Agriculture took it over and devoted a lot of time and effort and resources to uh, validation, uh, creating modules for different kinds of modules for families who had children versus didn't have children. Um, getting it down from a long form to a short form, making sure that it was validated on all kinds of different surveys with different populations. Um, and so in an ideal world, you know, I think we, to, to really move this forward in, in sort of an exponential kind of way, it would need the backing of uh, federal agencies that have that kind of, those kinds of resources to devote to that. Um, and, you know, just the Food Insecurity Index has, the validation work continues to this day. So this is, you know, it's, 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 it's always ongoing. There's always new questions to be asked. There's always refinements and how people are defining things. And so it's, it's, this is an ongoing project. So, you know, in the meantime, until we have those kinds of resources, Alex and I are continuing this work. Um, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to not get, there's something in the chat that I definitely want to get to, um, if it's okay to, to address that in the context of funding. Dave, are you okay with that? Go for it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so someone asked if there's potential applications for this when it comes to transit planning, like would this better inform 
uh, Title VI analysis? And I think I think this is a really important question to ask or an, an answer um, because it's all about can we use the TSI to think about uh, racial discrimination and transportation planning and how you know when uh, buses or bus lines are being determined or cut uh, can can we see if those have had disparate impacts on certain populations. And we believe, yes, that definitely, that using an original survey, you could uh, figure out, you know, where uh, these kinds of, how these kinds of decisions are impacting communities differently um, and whether they're having disparate impacts. And uh, I think that that's a, it's a very important point and I really appreciate someone asking that question. We are almost out of time, but I want to give each of our presenters to kind of leave us with sort of a parting thought. You know, what are we looking at moving forward here? Um, Aaron, would you be willing to start us off? You know, what 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 should we be paying attention to from your angle here? I think that there's, you know, hope for the future. Maybe I'm biased because I've spent so much time in the trenches with Alex and Alex and others like them. But, you know, it seems to me that there's more and more of an understanding of, you know, focusing on this as a sort of need um, and, better ways that we can study and measure it. So I have I have hope for the future. Okay. Alex Murphy. Um I also have a lot of hope for the future. This is a really exciting time uh, for people who are interested in transportation and transportation equity. Uh, we have an administration that's taking this seriously. We just passed an infrastructure bill that has a lot of money to go towards these things. Um, and so we're hopeful that we can make advancements on issues of transportation and security and equity through these, but also that we can start to use the index to really understand the impacts of those of those interventions and of those investments so that we can show definitively that um, when we make those kinds of investments it, it uh, improves people's transportation security and improves people's lives overall and, and um, our investments that are needed. Okay Alex Goldworth you started us off today so I'm hoping you can finish this up. I just want to echo that um, parts of this presentation were very wonky and confusing and about measurement, but the whole reason that we care about this is because we want to make an impact in people's lives. And even in addition to kind of the technical way this measure can be deployed, I hope it really shines a light on how important transportation is and what a basic need it is for people and that um, that results to kind of the channeling of more resources into our transportation infrastructure and that people are able to get to the places they want to go. Okay. Alex, Alex, and Aaron, I am so grateful for the time that you put putting this presentation together and just for the work that you're doing on this and for sharing it with our audience here. And for everyone that joined us, uh, thank you so much. So uh, again, we are going to send out uh, a recording of the presentation slides tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, but again, uh, thank you to our presenters. I, I am so grateful uh, that you took the time to do this. Okay. Bye now.